Let's have a good time in the Lord. Help us sing this song to Yahweh.
praise. I've witnessed the mightiness of your hand, God. Yes, mighty are the works of your hand. Because your name is above all names. You're worthy of all our praise. And mighty are works of your hand, as mighty are the works of your hand. Glory, 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 praise the Lord. Isn't that powerful? Amen. Mighty are the works of the hands of the God that we serve. And I give him the praise and the glory and the honor. I thank him for his loving kindness to us, his tender mercies. He wakes us up, give us the activities of our limbs. And he gave us a great day today in the DMV area. And I'm grateful to just be alive, just to be able to have the activities of my limbs and to be able to give him worship and praise. And uh, I know you're glad about that too. I'm so happy that you've joined us tonight, wherever you are around the world. I'm excited and grateful for your presence. Tonight is a special night. I have one of my newest, dearest, bestest friends from Chicago, Illinois, that's going to be ministering tonight. It's a, it's a special night and a special opportunity uh, to bring uh, Pastor James Meeks of the Salem Baptist Church of Chicago. A man is very gifted and anointed and qualified, and he's hanging out this week here in the DMV. And I'm honored to have him. So uh, we'll introduce you to him right quick. Let's watch this video and Pastor Meeks will be on right next. Pastor James T. Meeks is the founder and senior pastor of Salem Baptist Church of Chicago, which has been recognized as one of the fastest growing mega churches in the United States. In his 38 years of ministry, Pastor Meeks has taken his message of hope and reform around the world, including Israel, Africa, China, Jamaica, Argentina, Sweden, the Czech Republic, and Australia. In 1998, he led a rally to dry up the Roseland community, which resulted in the closing of 26 liquor stores. He distributed 30,000 Bibles to residents in the church's zip code and provided every prisoner in the state with the Bible on cassette. In 2002, Pastor Meeks successfully ran for Illinois State Senator. His win made him the first independent legislator ever elected to the Illinois Senate. He's the author of two books, How to Get Out of Debt and Into Praise, and Life-Changing Relationships, which has been received with critical acclaim. Pastor Meeks and his wife, Jamel, are the proud parents of four children and four grandchildren. Pastor James T. Meeks. Well, good evening, First Baptist, and what a joy it is to be here with my good friend, Pastor John Jenkins, his lovely wife, Trina, and to all of you who make up the First Baptist family, I know you have missed your church. I know you have missed being together and being in church when things were normal and we used to get a chance to get together and hug each other and turn around and say stuff to our neighbors. But you guys have been doing a fantastic job on uh, Zoom, uh, people have been watching your services all over the world. All of our friends are commenting on the great work that's going on here at First Baptist. And uh, we get up uh, and we watch your service before we have church on Sunday. And so let me applaud you for your excellence, for your great quality of the worship services that you've been producing during this uh, crisis, during this pandemic. Let me applaud you and know that it is not missed on those of us who study the ministry of First Baptist Glen Arden. I'm here with my friend, Pastor John Jenkins. I love him. He's a brother beloved and First Baptist. Indeed, you are blessed to have Pastor John Jenkins. Never take him for granted. Celebrate him in any way and every way you, you can. And whatever you think about it, just say a prayer for him because God is richly rewarding him and blessing him. Let's pray. 
Our Father and our God, we're grateful. We thank you for another privilege to teach and to hear your word taught. We love you, God, and we know that there is nothing too hard for you. I pray for everybody under the sound of my voice. I pray that if there's any depressed among us, that you would lift up our bowed down head. Now be our teacher and be our preacher. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. You are our strength. We count on you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is Bible study, and so let's go to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. I want to read uh, verses 19, 20, and 21. John chapter 20, verses 19 through 21. And hopefully, uh, we'll have enough time for questions. If those of you who are watching, you have some questions before the 8 o'clock hour. Verse 19 said, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. I'm always glad when Jesus shows up. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. Did you hear that? As my father hath sent me, even so send I you. First Baptist, I want to talk about tonight finding your call in a crisis. Finding your call. That's right. This is a sermon about you. Finding your call in a crisis. I believe that it is important in any crisis to try and discover what is God saying to you. It's okay. It's all right for us to analyze the crisis. It's okay for us to discuss over and over with our family and with our friends all of the effects of this present crisis. But I believe uh, tonight, First Baptist, that the most important thing that you and I can do in the midst of a crisis is to try to find out, it's for us, to try to figure out what is God saying to you. Matter of fact, you're there, you're sitting at home, you're in your living room, you're in your bedroom, your dining room. I just want you to put your hand on your own self and say, what is God saying to me? It doesn't take a genius to know that we are in a crisis. Our world is facing a pandemic. Our world is facing uh, this crisis that we know now as COVID-19 or as coronavirus. This thing that has crept up on us in the last eight months is something that none of us alive had ever seen before. The last uh, pandemic of this nature was in 1918, 1920, over 100 years ago. None of us were alive. And so none of us have ever seen this kind of crisis before. From Italy to Spain, from China to Germany, from the United States to Australia, everybody, there has not been a nation or a people group on the globe that has not been sucked into this pandemic or this crisis. In America, from Los Angeles to New York, from Wall Street to your street, from the outhouse even to the White House, this virus has found and affected everybody. Webster defines, and let me, let me stop there, Webster, the dictionary, Webster. I was preaching one night, and uh, I said, uh, Webster defines, and a little boy hunched his mother and said, why is he quoting Emmanuel Lewis? Mm -hmm. So I'm not talking about the little kid that played on Webster. I'm talking about the dictionary. Webster defines a crisis 
as a significant or a radical change in a person's life. That, that's what a crisis is. A crisis is a, a big change. A crisis is a sudden shift in our lives. You would agree with me, wouldn't you, First Baptist, that that defines the present state that you and I find ourselves in. Life as we know it has abruptly changed. Life as we know it has come to a standstill almost at a snail's pace. 225,000 Americans are dead. I want to stop there because uh, every time I hear that, I don't want to just hear it as a statistic. 225,000 Americans are dead and then just rush right past that. You know why? 225,000 people, that's somebody's grandmother. That's a grandfather. That's a nurse. That's a firefighter. That's somebody's mother. That's somebody's father. We have never seen anything like that before. All of life as we know it has come to a standstill. And here, here's the deal. There is no immediate answers in sight. We pray for a cure. We hope to have a cure. But nobody can tell you tonight when this thing is going to be over. In our text in John chapter 20, the disciples of Jesus, believe it or not, they find themselves in a crisis. Pastor Meeks, why are the disciples in a crisis? Okay, you have to remember now that this text occurs Easter Sunday night. This text occurs after the resurrection. So, the leader of this small band of followers, Jesus Christ, has just been killed. Jesus, the one that they had forsaken all to follow. You remember, they said, Master, we have forsaken all to follow you. And so they had expected Jesus. They had expected him to become a king and reign on a throne. They had expected Jesus to take care of all of their national enemies, to do away with everybody who was trying to harm Israel. And plus, they had seen Jesus do miracle after miracle. They saw him give sight to the blind. They saw him raise the dead. They saw him change water into wine. They saw miracle after miracle. And now, at the time of our text, this same Jesus in their opinion, is dead. Not only that, not only was Jesus dead, but they thought that the same people who had killed Jesus was looking for them. That's why they were hiding. As a matter of fact, the disciples were in quarantine themselves because they thought that the people who had killed Jesus was coming to get them. Several phases happened in the midst of a crisis. That's what I want to deal with tonight. Several phases happen. Whenever a crisis occurs, there are several phases. The first phase that happens in a crisis is fear. Fear is the first phase that happens in a crisis. John chapter 20, verse 19. The same day, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, watch this, for fear of the Jews. Whenever, you guys, whenever we're in the midst of a crisis, it's just human nature to get scared. Whenever we're in a crisis, it's just human nature to become afraid. Whenever something goes awry, whenever things change or something happens that you're not expected, whenever something happens outside of the norm, uh, fear becomes the first emotion that finds us. I tell you tonight, people all over the world are afraid. People all over this world are gripped with fear. Pastor, why are people gripped with fear? Well, people are gripped with fear because we think we might catch the virus. We don't know who going to catch the virus next. We're in fear because we know somebody with the virus, 
and we were just around them the other day, and now we don't know whether or not they gave the virus to us. People are in fear because some people are wearing a mask. Other people ain't wearing masks. So people are in drugstores and grocery stores humbugging because some people are walking around without a mask. People are fearful any time they get a cough. Any time. I was on the airplane last night, and somebody started coughing, and everybody on the plane turned around to look to see who was coughing. Fear. Whenever, here it is now, the last eight months, whenever you get an itch in your throat, oh, God, I wonder, I wonder if this is it. Uh, Stores, I I heard them say today that stores have to stock back up again. We're getting ready for the uh, second wave. And so people are in fear that there there may not be enough grocery in the stores. Uh, Fear. Fear because uh, we're tired of mask wearing. Now, I have a personal problem, if you would allow me 39 seconds to deal with my personal grievance. I'm a little fearful, too. I'm fearful that my wife is going to spray me to death. Because every time I come in the door, she's standing there with this big old can of Raid. (laughs) <laughs> and she's spraying me down as if she's exterminating me. I said, what is that? Lysol. Every time I come in, I'm being sprayed down with Lysol. If I touch a rail, don't touch the rail. So people are just fearful. We're fearful because, watch this now, watch this now. We're fearful because some of our jobs are being outsourced. Some of us are working from home, but some people are not working at all. Some people have been laid off, and you're fearful whether or not when they bring people back, will they bring you back. We're fearful because we're not getting paid. Anytime your money's funny, anytime something is messing with your money, I guess it causes us to get fearful. We're fearful because every bill that we have is due. Fearful because I saw a lady on the news the other night who uh, owned the building and uh, she had to pay her mortgage on the building, but her tenants were not paying their mortgage. She was depending on their rent in order to pay her mortgage. There's a moratorium in Chicago, a moratorium. You cannot put a person out during the pandemic, and so people are not paying their rent, but other people have mortgages to pay. So what do you do? So people are gripped with fear. Can I just, and and last one. We are fear because we don't know, we don't know how much longer we can stand being locked up with some of our family members. We have been locked up now for eight months in the house with some of the the same family members. Or we loved them eight months ago, but now we've been in that house for eight months. And so some of us don't know how much longer we're going to be able to take it. Can I just pause, First Baptist, this is Bible study. Can I just pause to remind us, the people of God, that, that's who I'm talking to tonight, the saints of God, the family of the committed, the, the, the called out. Can I just call, pause to remind us what the Bible says about fear? John chapter 14, verse 1. Listen to Jesus now. Listen to him saying, let not your heart be trouble. Pastor, how can I do that? You just described all of these things that are causing us to be fearful. Let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because ye believe in God. You believe in God. And so Jesus says to us tonight, come on now, pull it together. I, I, I know there's a long list of things that the pastor said people are afraid of, but I don't want believers to be troubled tonight. Can I tell you what the Bible says? Psalms chapter 34, verse 4. I sought the Lord, and that's the right place to turn. And he heard me, watch this, and delivered me from all. Somebody say all. 
and delivered me from all of my fears. I'm just here tonight, this is Bible study, to remind you now what the Bible says. Should I be fearful? Well, the Lord, 23rd Psalm, verse 1, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. That means tonight we don't have anything to have to want of because God is our shepherd. Tell somebody God's got your back. Listen to the 27th Psalm. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Watch this now. Watch this. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I'm trying to tell you now, I'm trying to tell you now, we have no reason to fear. We sing that song in Chicago. I know you all sing that song down here too. I wish I had a voice. I wish I had a, a praise team and a choir. I would tell you that we have, First Baptist, no reason to fear. We have no reason to fear. Why? Because the Lord is our light. The Lord is the strength of our lives. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Watch this now. God has not given us the spirit of of fear. The next time you uh, are afraid, the next time fear grips your heart, let me remind you now that that didn't come from God. It didn't come from God. The scripture says God has not given us the spirit of fear. So if God didn't give us the spirit of fear and we are fearful, then that means that we're picking up a spirit that comes from somewhere else, that spirit doesn't belong to us. And so it's just like, it's just like when you're at the uh, airport and you're standing at the conveyor belt and you see a piece of luggage comes by and it looks something like your luggage and you reach and grab it and you see the, oh, that ain't mine. You put it back. Do that with fear. Do that with fear. The next time you wake up uh, and, and, and fear is grabbing at you and you're about to reach and pick it up. So, oh, no, that ain't my bag because God has not given us the spirit of fear. Even in this trying time, even though we don't have the answers, even though we are in a crisis, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now, I'm going to tell you another thing about fear. Faith and fear can't live in the same heart. Not faith and fear. One, one, one of them got to move. And so uh, I used to have a deacon, Deacon Richard Greer. He's in heaven now. He used to say, people who pray don't worry. And people that worry don't pray. You got that? That's tweetable. You ought to tweet that. You ought to write that down. People who worry don't pray. And people who pray don't worry. God has not given us the spirit of fear. But that's the first phase in a crisis fear happens so the so jesus had just died the disciples are in a room they think somebody's coming after them next and so the bible said they were gripped with fear number two let's look back at the text the same day same day at evening first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the jews came jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you. The second phase in a crisis is that you got to find peace somewhere. You have to find peace somewhere. Domestic violence is on the rise. People are looking for peace. People are looking for peace. Marijuana use is on the rise. In the last eight months, it has been uh, documented that more people have used marijuana in the last eight months than they did the last 18 months. Why are they doing this? Because people are looking for peace. Guess what else is up? Alcohol use and alcohol sales because people are drinking alcohol because people are looking for peace. Anti-anxiety medication is on the rise. 
billions of dollars being sold in anti-anxiety medication because First Baptist, people are looking for peace. What are they going to do? It's a crisis. It's a pandemic. What are we going to do? While people are searching for peace everywhere, I came to talk to the church tonight. While people are looking for peace everywhere, I, I, I don't have answers for all of them, but I would if they would listen. But I do have an answer for those of us who make up the body of Christ. Can I recommend something to you? Can I tell you where we can find peace from? Well, let me tell you where we can't find it from. You ain't going to find peace on Facebook. Now, you're not going to do that. I, I, I know that we have a little more time on our hands and, and people spend a lot of time on Facebook, but you're not going to find peace on Facebook. And let me just remind the body of Christ something tonight. Stop arguing with people you don't know. Stop arguing with people over, over their opinion. But people jump on Facebook looking for peace. Matter of fact, you'd be more upset when you get off Facebook than you did when you first got on it. We're not going to find peace looking at Netflix. And I'm not against watching movies. I'm not even against people uh, trolling on Facebook. I'm just simply saying that if we're going there to look for peace, peace is not there. Peace is not. When the disciples were in a crisis, here it is. It's Easter Sunday night. When the disciples were afraid, the Bible says that they did not experience peace until, somebody say until, until they saw Jesus standing in their midst. It's right there in the text. It's right there in the text. They were assembled for fear of the Jews. Then came Jesus and stood in their midst and said, peace be unto you. And verse 20 said, then were the disciples glad when they saw Jesus. First Baptist, I'll tell you what we have to do. We have to put ourselves in a position to see Jesus because that's where our peace comes from. That we, we're not the world. We're not people out there in bars and taverns and clubs and trying to find our peace. Our peace comes from him. Well, what does the book say about him? What does the book, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, unto us, a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And listen to his name. His name shall be called Wonderful. You don't like that name. Okay. Counselor. You don't like that. All right. Mighty God. You don't like that name. The Everlasting Father. Or oh, I got a name you will like. The Prince of Peace. He's not just the giver of peace. Peace belongs to him. He is the prince of peace. Then were the disciples glad when they found Jesus. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says it like this. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. In other words, you got to say to yourself now, God, you got this. I belong to you. Jesus, you are alive and you're living in my heart. You see, in order for us to become a Christian, that's how we became Christians. You know that, right? We pray a prayer and we said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm a sinner. Well, ain't no need in having him there and not letting him do his thing. His thing is to run stuff. His thing is to be in charge. Let the peace of God rule your heart. John chapter 14 Verse 27, he says it another way. This is what Jesus said. Now, before Jesus left this world, this is the promise that he gave his disciples, and he says the same thing to you and I tonight. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. That's, that's, that's what Jesus is to us tonight. He is our peace. Somebody has a song, you are my peace and I worship you. He is our peace. We have to find our comfort and we have to find our joy in him. I have a sermon called, next time I come back, I'm going to preach it. I have a sermon called uh, Two Days That Will Kill You. Two days that will kill you. The two days that will kill you is yesterday and tomorrow. 
And most people don't have peace because we are so caught up in something that happened yesterday. It's the past. It's over. Or else we're concerned about what's supposed to happen tomorrow until we're not living in the right now. Jesus wants to meet you right now. Jesus is where you are right now. And Jesus is your peace. Last one, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is on Facebook, whose mind is on Netflix. Who, whose mind is on the next drink I'm going to take. No, no, thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. All we have to do. That's why Paul said, uh, finally, my brother, and whatsoever things are true or lovely or of a good report, if there's any virtue or if there's any praise, think on these things. All we have to do is remember that he is our peace and think on these things. Last of all. Uh, last thing I want to tell you, in every crisis, there is a call. There, there is a call in every crisis. Look at verse 21. Then said Jesus unto them again, peace be unto you. As my father has sent me, even so I send you. As my father has sent me, even so I'm sending you. Whenever there's a crisis, you look at this book. Whenever there's a crisis, there's a call. In the book of Exodus, chapter 3, the children of Israel had been in slavery for about 400 years. That's a crisis. That's a big crisis. But in the midst of that crisis, there came a call. God said to Moses, Moses, you got to do something. You got to go and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. In the book of Judges, there was a crisis. The children of Israel were hiding grain. The Midianites were coming. They were taking the grain every time Israel would hide the grain. They were torturing Israel. But then there was a call, and the call came to a man by the name of Gideon. And uh, Gideon said, now, Lord, I can't do this. I'm, God said, don't tell me what you can't do now. I I'm calling you to do it. In the midst of every crisis, there is a call. As the Father had sent me, so I'm sending you. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah said there was a crisis. The crisis was the king, King Uzziah, had died. But Isaiah said, in the year of coronavirus, in the year of the pandemic, in the year of the crisis, I saw the Lord. He was high. He was lifted up. His train filled the temple. Uh, angels were worshiping him. And don't forget now, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of the crisis, don't forget to worship God now. I know you can't come to the building like you used to come to the building, but you could worship at home. You could get down on your knees in your bedroom, and you could get down in the, the beautiful house that God has given you, the beautiful home that he's given you. He expects you to give him some praise in that house. You can worship God. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord, I, I, I worship God, and in the midst of my worship, I heard a call. I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who will go for us? Whom shall I send? Then said I, here am I, send me. I came to tell somebody tonight that we've been in crisis mode for a while now. We've been sitting around in quarantine for the last eight months. It's time, I'm talking to you, it's time to stop being scared. It's time to stop being afraid. It's time to stop doing nothing. And it's time, watch this now, this is the big thing. It's time to stop acting like you don't have anything to add. It's time for you to find and embrace your call. I wish you would say that to somebody. I wish you would say to somebody in your house, let's embrace our call. Oh, uh, what can we do, you and I, you, what can you do over the next few months that would lift somebody's burden? That, that's what life is all about, to see who can lift somebody's burden. Now, I didn't ask you, I didn't ask you what could the church do. I did not ask you what can the community do. I didn't ask you what can the mayor do. I'm not even asking what can the president do. What is God calling you to do? That's the question. What is God calling you to do? Can I, can I give you some, some examples? What is God calling you to do in this crisis? Let me encourage somebody. Post a cheerful message every day 
on Facebook or Instagram. Just, just come up with something cheerful. God loves you. God is thinking about you. Uh, Jesus is the best thing that ever happened, and he's your friend. Post a cheerful, what is God calling you to do? Uh, call a family member. Organize your family member for a, a weekly or a monthly Zoom call. Uh, be the one. People can't get together for a family reunion. We can't even get together for Thanksgiving now. But we can get together on, on Zoom. We can get together by way of telephone. How about organizing your family? How about texting a cheerful thought to people every day? Pick 10 people to text a cheerful thought to. How about, watch this, how about uh, helping a neighbor empty their garbage? How about picking up, uh, teaching a child how to read? That's a, that's a good one. How about teaching a child how to read? You have nieces and nephews in your family. Let's use this time to make sure that our young nieces and nephews or grandchildren are proficient in reading. Let's listen to them read. Let's correct their reading. How about that? How about offering to pick up the grocery for a neighbor? Knock on the neighbor's door and say, I'm, I'm headed to the grocery store. You be somebody's Instacart. Because Jesus lives in you, you be their Instacart. How about writing some handwritten notes to first responders, telling them, we appreciate you. We thank you for what you're doing. How about raking your neighbor's leaves or uh, in, when you get on your little moor and, and get all your leaves up, how about getting up the leaves of a neighbor? How about giving out masks to people who are not wearing masks? How about, here is another one, posting a cooking recipe online. Just whatever recipes you got. Post them online. Now, hopefully your food don't hurt nobody. But uh, post a recipe online. How about writing letters to guys or women who are in jail? How about writing letters telling them that Jesus loves them? How about cash apping your beautician and your barber? Saying, I know I ain't been there in a while. I know that people don't go to the barber shop like they used to go, but... Here's a little something I was thinking about you. How about next time you at the drive up? How about asking them how much is the bill behind me? How about paying the bill of a person behind you that's in the drive up? What is God calling you to do? What does God want you to do? God doesn't want you to just sit there and mope and be sad and we're in a crisis. God is calling you to do something. I want to show you, before I come back and end, I want to show you a video of a, uh, a, a lady, uh, a young lady who goes to our church. Her grandmother decided she was going to do something in the midst of a crisis. I want to show it to you, and then I'll be back to close out. Recording artist just dropped her first single, and here's the thing: she's 90 years old. Joni Lum tells us that's how one singer stayed active during this pandemic. Essie Pugh has been singing all her life in the church choir and in isolation at home. Her grandchildren were worried about her being lonely or inactive during quarantine. But Essie had goals. Well, this song just came to me, you know, Jesus reign forever. She collaborated with the pianist, sang in a recording studio, and now her song, Jesus Reigns Forever, is being shared to lift others who might feel lonely. She's so happy. Just think about a song you like and you sing it. It makes you happy. COVID-19 keeps Essie Pugh from singing in church, but she is on the move, which she notes is the key to happiness. It actually motivates me to get up and get moving, you know, and do something. She's a platinum singer in our eyes. This first-time recording artist already has merch and a strong fan base. If she can do it at, at 90, in her 90s, you know, I can do it in half her age and people are 20. I think she's just really 
showing people that during these tough times, you can really plow through it if you just, whatever dream that you've been holding, just pursue it, go for it. When I'm grown, they still hear me singing. Now, Essie Pugh has an approach to exercise. She says, in the beginning, you get tired, but you gotta keep going until you're untired. That's how she approaches life, and that's how she's getting through this pandemic. Joni Lum, Fox 32 News. She's 90 plus years old, and hello, Miss Pugh. She's watching our service tonight. Thank you so much for the inspiration. She's 90 plus years old. She said, rather than just sitting at home, wasting time away, God was calling her to write a song. And she's written a song entitled, Jesus Reigns Forever. And long after she's not here anymore, guess what will still be here? Her song, Jesus Reigns Forever. Who, who am I talking to tonight? Who is God calling to write a book? Who is God calling to write a play? Who is God calling to write children's stories? Or who is God? God is calling you to do something. And in this crisis, you got to find a call. Why? Because Jesus says, as my father has sent me, so I send you. So let's have a little challenge. Let's have a First Baptist challenge. Let's uh, hashtag uh, First, Baptist Bible, First Baptist Bible class challenge. That's it. First Baptist Bible class challenge. You hashtag that and then write in there, what is God calling you to do? What is God calling you to do? We're going to let it run for a month and see what ideas we get. First Baptist Bible class challenge. What is God calling you to do? I'm convinced he's calling you to do something. No, Pastor Jenkins is not supposed to do everything. No, so Satrina is not supposed to do everything. God has made you. You are fearfully. You are wonderfully made. Hashtag First Baptist Challenge. God is calling Bible class challenge. God is calling you to do something. And you can do uh, what God has called you to do. All right. So do we have any questions tonight? Pastor? Hey, Pastor. Excellent, excellent, excellent challenge and encouragement. I want to thank you so much for sharing with us tonight and uh, we do have a few questions let me uh call them up and ask you thank our members for a writing does it matter how we pray whether it's out loud or internally i think I got, I got an answer for that i promise you i do it matters i think first of all that prayer should be on our knees because if we are not on our now when you're driving your car if you're praying, driving your car, that's fine. But when you say your prayers at your home, I think we should be on our knees. I think that praying on our knees is a sign of submission, and we are humbling ourselves before the Lord. People who pray in the bed, we don't never know when prayer ends and sleep started. And so I think that we should humbly submit ourselves before the Lord, and then we should... Uh, Get on our knees and we should pray. And we should pray. Uh, you don't have to pray out loud. As long as you're talking to God, God can hear you. But if you live by yourself and ain't nobody there, then you can talk out loud. If you live in a house and other people are there, you don't have to talk out loud. Okay, thank you, Pastor. All right, here's another question. How do, how do you de 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 make a difference from <laughs> the... Differentiate. Yeah, that's the word, you know. <laughs> how do you... De de that word... From the fear and discerning God telling you not to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. How do you know the, the, the difference whether it's fear from you doing something or whether God is saying to you, don't go down that road? You, you ask him. You ask him, God, are you telling me not to go or is it just me? Am I being fearful? You ask him. The Bible says, if any man desires wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth all men liberally. God is obligated to help us to understand what direction he wants us to take. And so you don't have to move until uh, there's a song that we sing in the church and pretty good theology, I guess. Stand still until God's will is clear. Right? Great. Excellent. Uh, God is calling me to do something, yet responsibilities in this pandemic make it challenging. How do you overcome that? 
uh, 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 one bite at a time, just like eating an elephant, one bite at a time. So what happens is that when we have responsibilities, uh, we tend to do nothing, uh, do something, do a part of it, do a piece of it, do, map out a strategy and say, each day I'm going to do a little bit of what God has called me to do while I'm doing my other responsibilities. But whatever you do, don't do nothing. Got to do a little bit of it. Great. All right. Uh, when I pray for family, friends, church family, pastor, coworkers, I pray internally so that the adversary doesn't know what I'm praying to God. Does that matter? It, it, it does not make a difference what the adversary knows. He does not have all power. It is not as if the devil can hear what you said and say, oh, I'm getting ready to do this now. Uh, the devil doesn't have all power. God has all power. Some, the Bible says that sometimes we don't even know what to pray for, but the Holy Spirit interprets our prayers. As long as you are talking to God, let God worry about the devil. Let, let God deal with the devil. You talk to God, and God can handle the devil. I promise he can handle the devil. Pastor, thank you for coming. No, stay right there. Don't go nowhere. I, I love you being here tonight. And Man, I, I love I being here. I want to thank you for, from the bottom of my heart for your sharing and challenging us in a very significant way. And I know uh, there's some people out there who are fearful and stressed out and worried and overwhelmed. And uh, I'd like for you to just make an appeal to them. You've touched many hearts. I can tell by these questions that you've touched some hearts. But we always try to reach out to the unsaved, the unsure, the unchurched, the uncommitted persons. And uh, can you just make an appeal to Absolutely. those? Absolutely. Those of you who are looking tonight, and first of all, let me talk to two groups of people. Let me talk to those of you who are in the church one more time and just remind you that faith doesn't come by, uh, faith comes by hearing. Faith doesn't come by having heard. So you heard the word tonight, but you got to keep listening to the word. You got to keep listening. The more words you get, the more faith you're going to get and the more fear that you will overcome. Faith cometh by hearing, not having heard. Uh, so once we turn off uh, the, the Zoom tonight, get back up in the middle of the night and turn it back on. Listen to it again. Listen to it again, over and over and over again, so that you could feel yourself with the Word of God. For those of you who are watching us tonight, and for whatever reason, you've never made a commitment. You've never asked Jesus to come into your heart to save you. Let me tell you, first of all, you're not a bad person, and you're in the right place, and today is the right day. Let me tell you that Jesus died for you. If there had been nobody else in the world, Jesus still would have come and he still would have died for you. I want you to do something real quick. I don't know who I'm talking to. I want you to forgive yourself. I want you to forgive yourself of the things you've done wrong. I want you to forgive yourself of the mistakes you've made. Stop beating yourself up. Stop punishing yourself. God loves you. And I want you to remember that Jesus died for you. And, and, and the greatest thing that you can do tonight is what a number of us have already done. And that is to ask Jesus to come into your heart, to save you, to be the savior of your soul, to forgive you of your sins. And let me tell you that as soon as you pray this prayer, it's done. Jesus will come into your heart. He will forgive your sins. He ain't gonna even remember your sins anymore. And that's why I told you that since he's not gonna remember your sins anymore, don't you remember them anymore. You forget them too. And you go on and you can live a victorious life. Those of you who don't know where you are in Christ, you're unsure about your walk with Jesus Christ, I want you to pray this prayer with me and say, Lord Jesus, thank you that I'm alive tonight and that I'm able to talk to you. Come into my heart. Lord Jesus, I accept you right now as my Savior and as the Lord of my life. I'm trusting you and only you to direct my path. I own you now. I believe that you live in, in me. I trust you 
with the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do two things for me. Number one, I want you to tell somebody, anybody, that tonight I asked Jesus to come into my heart. Tell somebody now, don't be afraid. If you be ashamed to own him, he might be ashamed to own you. So I want you to own him. Tell somebody, I accepted Jesus Christ. And then be a blessing to this ministry. You know what would bless this ministry? It would bless this ministry to no end. If you would get on Facebook, the medium in which you're watching now, and say, Pastor Jenkins, tonight at 6, at 756, I ask Jesus to come into my heart. Thank you to the church. But tell the church that you ask Jesus to come into your heart. Why? Because that is why we come to you. That is why we have these Tuesday night Bible studies. That's why we have Sunday service. It's just for you. And so Pastor Jenkins and the church wants to know that you accepted Jesus as your personal Savior. I love you. I praise God for you. Remember, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Remember, Jesus is our only peace. And remember now, in this crisis, you have a call. You got to let us know what God is calling you to do. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor. That's just a wonderful message and wonderful word. I want to uh, thank him for that challenge and that appeal to you tonight. There's a phone number you can call right there on the screen. There's an email you can write to. There's a button you can click on our website. Just do one of those things. If you prayed that prayer, or, or maybe you wanted to, but you didn't, but you know now I, I should have prayed that prayer, go ahead and make that phone call. Call us right now or email us or send us or hit that commit button and we will direct you on what you need to do. All right? Your life will never be the same again. Fear won't control you anymore. You'll be a new creation, a new person walking in a new life and in a new way. He will forgive you and wash your slate clean. Pastor Meeks has given us clear instructions and I want to thank him from the depths of my heart of him sharing with us tonight. All right? Thank you so much again pastor and thank you all for watching i got some special announcements i want to make right after these announcements right here so we're going to give, show you these announcements hang on for just a couple of minutes then i have a, a couple of special announcements to make that I, you don't want to miss all right okay watch this This Saturday, October 31st at 10 a.m., join FBCG as we stream an ordination service for the 12 new deacons and deaconesses of First Baptist. Tune in on the church website. We celebrate these members who've been chosen and elevated to this position at our church. October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. At FBCG's Cancer Support Ministry, you have a spiritual, informative, and supportive place to comfortably discuss fears and concerns about cancer. Whether you're a patient, caregiver, or family member, we're here to listen, laugh, and love our way through life issues. Through every step of the journey, the Cancer Support Ministry is here to provide prayer, educational literature, encouragement, and inspiration. For more information on how to join the Cancer Support Ministry, send an email to cancersupport at fbcglenarden.org. Join the Military Care Ministry of the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden Wednesday, November 11th from 10 a.m. to noon for the 2020 Virtual Veterans Appreciation Celebration. This event will celebrate our veterans and their sacrifices while providing information about the services and benefits available to veterans. Register today at fbcglenarden.org slash veterans to join us for this amazing virtual celebration. The newest issue of FBCG's digital church-wide publication, Vision Magazine, is now available. This edition, entitled Faith Over Fear, contains several articles on the upcoming November 3rd election, coping with the COVID-19 pandemic, and the impacts of the recent protest against social injustices. To see this edition of Vision Magazine, log on to fbcglenarden.org slash publications. That's the news for this week. You can find more details about these and other events at fbcglenarden.org.
right, please make note of those announcements. Let me say a couple things that are very important. Number one, we will not be having Bible study next Tuesday. It is election day. We want to make sure to encourage everyone to go and vote. We want to encourage you to vote. You can vote next Tuesday or before. In our state, of course, um, there's early voting. And we want to encourage everybody to let your voice be heard. Very significant, very important. This is, in fact, one of the most critical in, uh, elections in our, in our lifetime. And so we want to encourage you to cast your vote. And if you are a senior, 55 and above, and you live in Prince George's County, 55 and above, and you live in Prince George's County, and you need transportation to go vote, we will be seeking to provide transportation as much as we possibly can. So you can go on our website and get information, and give us a call, and we'll schedule you. We'll try to make that happen. If you need somebody to go with you, uh, you'll be able to bring one person with you. But you'll get all of the details by either calling the church or going to our website, and there should be a link on the website to give you all of the instructions about that. Okay, so no Bible study next Tuesday. We are encouraging everyone to vote. And our last Bible study for this year will be November 17th. So write that down. November 17th is our last Bible study for the year. All right. We love you. Again, thank you again, Pastor Meeks. You were tremendous today uh, dealing with that faith. And there's a call upon your life during this season and time. Don't miss it. Okay? God bless you, everybody. Have a great night.